All right, let's see, we got all the right screens on, very good. All right, good morning everybody, and welcome to Documenting the Troops, Military Records on Florida Memory and at the State Archives of Florida, and State Library as well in there. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Josh Goodman, I'm the Archives Historian here at the State Archives of Florida. I do outreach all over the state and uh, spend a good bit of time selecting documents and digitizing them for use on floridamemory.com, our online outreach tool here at the State Library and Archives of Florida. My contact information will be on this slide, and then of course at the end of the presentation, I always encourage you guys to contact me anytime you have questions about the resources that we have here at the State Archives. And then of course, if you have questions about the State Library's resources, I can direct those to the appropriate colleagues. Uh, but let's uh, say just a little bit about sort of where we are and, and what we do here at the State Library and Archives. We are located in the R.A. Gray Building, uh, just a couple of blocks behind the Capitol here in Tallahassee. We are open to the public uh, from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., except for state holidays. Uh, and then we also have some scattered Saturday hours that we're open. Uh, those uh, are handled uh, month by month. We're usually open one Saturday a month, and uh, we announce those on our social media and on the website. So, uh, so for those of you who are out of town and would need to plan a little weekend trip to get up here, we certainly encourage you to do that, and those hours are available for that. You do not need an appointment. There's oftentimes a misconception that the archives, you've got to be a, a professor or a professional historian or working on your next book or something and, and that you have to make some kind of deal with, uh, with the archivists who are up here. Nothing could be farther from the fact our reference area is public and we encourage you to take full advantage of it whenever you'd like to do. We also have free parking to offer, so it's nice and easy. You just drive right into our parking garage and then walk right into the building. All right, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Um, as you can imagine, uh, military records can be a very exciting part of building out a profile on, uh, on an ancestor. Once you get beyond the process of building out a family tree, it's always interesting to know what kinds of military involvement some of your ancestors may have had, or uh, if you're a uh, working in a library or, or in another similar institution, working with your patrons, this can be uh, one of the most interesting parts of, of their genealogical journey. And so we certainly want to, uh, to make as many resources available for that as we can. Um, we will focus on sort of what we can know, uh, the different kinds of military records that are available, and then what we'll do is really the best way to go through this is to sort of go through the different wars and point out the different resources that are available for each one. Uh, and I should mention here at the outset that it, that it is going to be a little bit of a marathon. So while we won't look at any particular resource in great incredible depth, um, my main goal today is to sign up, kind of kind of show you just what's available, what's out there, uh, and how to get to it. Because so many of these resources are available to you either uh, online or with a quick call to the uh, State Archives Reference Desk without you having to pay for a subscription to anything. Um, some things are, you know, are going to require you to get to Ancestry or Fold3 or something like that. Um, or there may be alternatives to, to go to other free databases for it. But there's a lot that you can get to just from your computer uh, without having to buy anything. So we want to point those out as much as possible. I should also say that this is a selection of what is available. Uh, once you start looking at a particular ancestor, you may find it necessary to call on resources that are really, really specific. Uh, things like prisoner of war records or hospital discharges during the Civil War, something like that. Uh, but so what we're going to cover today is is kind of the big uh, the big highlights. And then if you've got more specific questions down the line, of course we can certainly help you locate those records. So let's start off with what can we know? And the 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 first part of that is that what we can know about an ancestor's military background, uh, about their military career, very significantly by time period, the conflict that they served in, and even what state you're in. And the reason for that is that records were not kept the same in every war. And in fact, you know, the major conflicts that folks are usually interested in studying, the Civil War, the World Wars, the Spanish-American War, uh, here in Florida, of course, the Second uh, and Third Seminole War, there are, there's a lot of a space in between those conflicts, and so there's plenty of time for the War Department uh, to change up the way that it keeps records 
Uh, there's plenty of time for records to, to go missing or to be indexed, and so there's just a lot of different ways that those records appear. Um, and then as far as state records go, uh, sometimes uh, here in the state of Florida, you know, we've, we've got a lot of great military records dating all the way back to the uh, Seminole War era, but if you're looking for ancestors uh, who served another state, the records there may be more complete for some, uh, for some conflicts, maybe less complete. Uh, they may be organized differently. So it's, it's just a, there's no single database. There's no magic bullet that's going to get you uh, all of these things. So this is, this is mainly going to be uh, a way to sort of inspire you as to what is available generally. We can typically know, though, um, across these different conflicts, we can typically find the dates that someone served which can be very helpful if we're trying to determine the age of an ancestor uh, or trying to figure out when they may have been alive versus, you know, if we think they might have died at some point uh, down the line. We can figure out oftentimes where they enlisted and where they were discharged or at least where they served. Um, so this can help you if you're trying to determine whether an ancestor lived in a certain part of the South or, or, or a certain part of the country at a given time. We can uh, sometimes determine the rank, honors, and details of service for an ancestor. This can be really great because uh, if you say you have um, an ancestor who served in the Civil War, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of battlefields out there that you can go to today. If you determine uh, that your ancestor served with a particular unit, you can look at a unit history from that unit and figure out exactly where your ancestor may have been uh, and, and sort of walk in their footsteps, which can be a very rewarding experience. We can also figure out, in some cases, some biographical data that we normally might expect to get from other kinds of resources, like the census. Uh, or from, uh, from some other sort of record. Uh, for example, uh, enlistment data from the Civil War era can sometimes include things like height, weight, and eye color, um, which, you know, there, it may be impossible to find that information anyplace else. So there's, I guess the, the short version of the story is that there's a lot we can do to build profiles of ancestors, to go beyond just, uh, just uh, establishing the family tree and establishing profiles for ancestors. So a lot we can know. The main categories of records that we'll look at, uh, unfortunately, we can't say that these are available uh, for every single conflict in exactly the same way. Again, it varies. Uh, but the main categories of records that we'll look at today are examples of individual service records. Those are records where we're talking about just one person, when they enlisted, where they enlisted, what kinds of things they did while they were in the military, the circumstances of them getting out of the military, uh, that sort of thing. Muster rolls and unit records and histories, those are going to be uh, records that were kept by the commanders of uh, the unit that an ancestor served in, or perhaps by the headquarters for that particular division or that particular branch of service uh, that your ancestor served in. Uh, casualty and burial, burial records, of course, those, are, those were important at the time so that family members would, would know what happened uh, to, their, uh, to their family member, and, and then, of course, uh, that's going to help us locate uh, where an ancestor might be buried or, or find out what happened to them. So if you, you've got an ancestor you've been looking at, then all of a sudden they just drop out of the documentary record. It may be because they died in battle. Uh, so we can, we can figure those things out. And then pension and land bounty records. Uh, pension records can be fantastic because in order to get money uh, from the government uh, for, for government service, oftentimes an applicant would have to provide some details about their service, things like what unit they served in, uh, you know, where they served, what battles they were in. Sometimes they had to include uh, affidavits from people they served with. So you can, you can oftentimes find a good bit of, of really great data uh, from pension records, especially those Civil War pension applications, which we'll look at soon. But let's go ahead and jump right into our first conflict. We're going to start off with the Second Seminole War. Uh, of course, we do have some records from the uh, Revolutionary War uh, and, and folks who served in the earlier Indian Wars that occurred before the Second Seminole War here at the, uh, the State Archives. But to kind of keep it to where the bulk of our requests for information come from, we're going to start here. The Second Seminole War took place from 1835 to 1842 and essentially was the United States military's effort to move the Seminole Indians out of the Florida Peninsula. There were a number of uh, conflicts between white settlers in the northern part of the state who were starting to sort of press down into north central and central Florida 
And the more that that happened, the more skirmishes that occurred, and eventually it broke out uh, into open warfare. The two main types of records uh, that we'll look at today on, on this are mu uh, muster rolls of the Florida militia units. There were a number of regular army units that came down into Florida uh, to, to fight that war, but there were also a number of Florida militia units that participated in well uh, as well. As a matter of fact, they oftentimes uh, argued that militia units from the local area would know the area better and were better, uh, would be better for uh, attempting to achieve the, the military objectives of the war. So there's a lot of mili militia units that get, uh, that get involved. There's also the compiled service records of service members in the Florida Indian Wars. We'll look at those as well. So let's take a look first at the militia uh, unit muster rolls. We do have a number of those available in the original here at the State Archives, but uh, you do not have to access the originals. Uh, the, um, Florida Department of Military Affairs has uh, already back in the 70s and 80s gone through and, uh, and transcribed those for us so that we don't have to use those uh, in the original. And they are available uh, from the State Library of Florida uh, at this uh, eDocs address that we've got right here. I'm going to go ahead and click on this just to show you what it looks like. Oh, it doesn't want to show them to us. Well, what we'll do is we're going to go over to our web browser. And anytime you're wanting to pull something from the State Library's catalog, you use library.florida.gov. That is the State Library's online catalog. Okay, I'm going to go to it. Yes, no, maybe so. Hmm. There we go. All right, and so what we can do is we can type in muster rolls, and I'm going to add the word Seminole and we can get right to Florida Militia Muster Rolls Seminole Indian Wars. And what this is going to do is this is going to take you to a page on the State Library's eDoc server where all of those muster rolls, they're in a series of about 10 volumes, here they are, and you can go into each one of them individually. I'm not going to click on it right now because they're pretty large PDFs because uh, what they've done is they scanned in all of those volumes where they transcribe those muster rolls and uh, they're text searchable because they were typewritten, so they were able to run them through text recognition software. Once you get into that PDF, you just type in the last name of the ancestor that you're looking for, and you're going to be able to get right to them. All right, so let's jump back into our PowerPoint. So that's the muster rolls. Remember, that's, that's a record that, that's going to contain everybody from individual units. The great advantage here is that you'll be able to look at, uh, you'll be able to figure out the unit that your ancestor was in if they were in a Florida militia unit. And once you know that unit name, uh, or, or if it happens to be a, another unit that was numbered later on down the line, a unit number, then you can look for uh, that unit in histories of the war and figure out the movements of that unit as they went through the course of the war. Now, compiled service records for the Florida Indian Wars. These are records kept by the federal government as opposed to the state government. Um, and what compiled service records are, essentially, is uh, what makes them compiled is, is uh, around the turn of the century, the War Department actually went through and created card files uh, where they, they went to all of the available records, muster rolls, um, enlistment records, prisoner of war records, uh, just every kind of record they had, and they created these index cards. And then the index cards would be resorted by individual so that you wouldn't have to go through 20 different kinds of records to find everything that you wanted to know about an individual soldier. You could go to this compiled service record and get all of that in one place. And I've got an example of it over here on the right side of the screen. This was done for the Florida Indian Wars. We've got them for the Civil War. We've got them for the Spanish-American War. We do have these on microfilm here at the State, uh, state Archives, uh, and you can get them from a number of other archives and libraries around the state as well. They're also available on Ancestry.com, so I'm going to show you kind of how you look for that. Remember, these are compiled service records from the Florida Indian Wars. Let's take a look at how to do that. So um, I've got Ancestry Library Edition up here. It's the same records that you get from, from Ancestry.com regularly. Um, so you could get this if you're public library or, or if a local research library, university library, something like that. Uh, whoever happens to have a subscription to Ancestry, you can get to them that way. So I'm going to show you how you can get to that particular source very quickly. If I click on Search and go down to Card Catalog, 
all right? I can search for the title of a specific group um, right here, and I'm just going to type in uh, compiled service records Indian, all right? And it goes right to exactly the ones that I wanted, Florida compiled service records for the Florida Indian Wars. Now this one, it's showing me that these are, this is for the third Seminole War here. Or, no, excuse me, that's going through the whole thing there. It looks like they've got the second Seminole War and third Seminole War, which took place from 1855 to 1858, all in one spot. So that's when you can go in and search by an individual, um, an individual um, ancestor. One word of caution here that's going to help you out. Um, this is, you, you have to keep in mind that these records are being filtered through a couple of different possibilities for human error. The person who took the original handwritten record could have misspelled your ancestor's name. It could have been mistranscribed by the folks at Ancestry. Uh, so you want to, to be willing to try a couple of different spellings if you don't get the person who you want on the first try. You also don't want to get too crazy with putting in the first and middle names. So if you've got somebody named John Christopher Gaucher who's in your, in your uh, family tree, um, you're not necessarily going to get John Christopher Gaucher by putting all of that in here. In fact, uh, it could be that he's in there as J.C. Gaucher. They could have misspelled Gaucher. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. So just because you don't get an ancestor on the first try, do be willing to maybe leave out the first and middle names on the first time and just be willing to go through the list. Um, you know, be willing to try a few different things to make sure you get the results you're looking for. All right, so moving on to, oh, this is a good one too. All right, so the WPA Veteran Grave Registration Project. Now, in the 1930s, when the Works Progress Administration was coming up with all kinds of projects to put people back to work uh, during the Great Depression, one of the most interesting projects, I think, that they came up with is they sent people around to all of these cemeteries all over the state of Florida, and they got them to record all of the graves belonging to veterans. And they actually indexed them according to what war they had fought in. They cross-referenced it with military records to determine what unit they had served in, uh, what rank they achieved, all that sort of thing. And uh, so all of that information is available. All the, uh, the uh, Department of Military Affairs has republished uh, the card file. They've essentially made a typescript out of the card file uh, that the WPA originally created with all this information. And you can get to all of this through UF Digital Collections. All right, so we're going to take a look at how to do this. It's in nine different volumes, and uh, there's... Um, um, Let's see, I think what I'll do is I'll show you what these pages look like and then I'll show you how to get to them. So here's what you get. So let's say that you've got an ancestor uh, who was buried in Charlotte County, okay? You've got an ancestor who's buried in Charlotte County and you, you know that they were in the Second Seminole War or maybe the Civil War, something like that. What you would do is you would go to the appropriate volume, again, there's nine of them, and they'll tell you what counties are in each one. When we get to UF Digital Collections, you'll see that. So you'll open that up, and then it'll have an alphabetical list of all the veterans in that county, and then it'll describe to you what, it'll tell you what uh, cemetery they're in. And at one time, they even had, uh, they even had these graves mapped out. They had the graves numbered. Now, and a lot of those plats were left with the counties rather than being transferred to the state. So most of the plats no longer survive, but they do give you a description of the cemetery. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So, for example, if we take a look here. This is an example of a page that I pulled from the Charlotte County uh, listing uh, of the WPA Veteran Grave Registration. And you can see all these different veterans, and they're listing the wars, and these abbreviations are all explained in a preface at the beginning of the volume. So, for example, W stands for World War I. Remember, only one world war had happened at that point. Uh, that's a tongue twister. Um, so, of course, anytime you see the W, they're referring to the First World War. The C stands for Civil War. Uh, I stands for Indian War. So, for example, if we were looking at this for Charlotte County, we would know that Adam McNeely uh, had participated in, in the Indian Wars. That's going to be either the Second or Third Seminole War. In Pittman's uh, company, Third Florida Militia, we get the dates of his birth and death. And then if we look here, you'll see that they're giving us uh, a plot and grave number. The plot, that's referring to what cemetery. And so what we can do is we can flip farther along in the volume 
and it'll actually tell us, it'll give us a description of all of those different, uh, all those different cemeteries. Now this one doesn't go all the way to 16, so we can't see where Mr. McNeely is buried, but what they did was they gave you uh, driving directions to all of these different uh, cemeteries, and they, they put in the section, township, and range. Now why that's so important, because you're thinking to yourself, well you can get this on find a grave, can't you? Well, yes, sometimes, but if, if somebody was buried in a family cemetery that's on private land, oftentimes the, the volunteers that contribute to find a grave haven't gotten a chance to go out to that because they can't get permission to get on the, fun, on the family land. Sometimes those cemeteries have been destroyed or relocated. Um, so sometimes these WPA guys were able to get to cemeteries that just don't exist uh, in anybody else's calculations. So how do you get to these volumes? How do you get to these uh, WPA Veteran Grave Registration Project volumes? Well, you'll need to get on your internet browser, and uh, a quick way to do this is to just go to UF Digital Collections, just search for that. And it'll, it should be the first thing that pops up in your search results. Here we go. University of Florida Digital Collections. And then if we type in into the collections grave registration, that should do it. Boom. There we go. WPA Veterans Grave Registration. By the way, you notice that I used quotation marks around my search terms. That's because if I didn't put that around there, I would get in my search results every single thing in UF Digital Collections that has the word grave or registration in it. Using quotation marks is going to narrow down your search results so that you get exactly what you want. This is typically true across all search engines, so that's a, a, a good trick to keep in mind. All right, so here's the catalog record for those grave registrations, and then if I click on this little drop-down menu here, it's going to give me all of the uh, different volumes that are in the collection, and it's going to tell me exactly which counties are in each one. Now, the, one of the first things you may notice is that not every county is represented in this. There are a number of counties that the WPA did not get to during the course of this project, and that's common with a lot of WPA projects. A lot of their stuff is incomplete, but in the places where, you, where they did do the work, uh, it's really valuable to use. So definitely in, encourage you to take a look at this. All right, jumping back into the PowerPoint, let's jump over to the Mexican War. All right. Uh, this was a, a conflict between the United States and Mexico in the 1840s. Uh, Florida did not furnish a ton of folks. Only about three companies, three or four companies of men went over to serve in this conflict, uh, but they are there, and this is at a, a moment when uh, folks were, were sort of pouring into Florida uh, there at the end of the Second Seminole War, which ends in 1842. Uh, once that war was complete, people felt safer about moving into North Central and especially Central Florida, uh, and so you've got a lot of folks who were moving into the area, and uh, then you know a lot of them volunteered to, to go over and fight in this conflict. We do have uh, muster rolls and service records of Florida volunteers that are available for this. There's also a roster of Mexican war veterans that was completed in the late 19th century by a guy named uh, Robarts. And that's going to be good because it not only shows you the Florida folks, but it also lists out all of the officers uh, who uh, volunteered for the war from other states as well. Also, there's a gentleman by the name of Russell James who uh, did a master's thesis that he called Too Late for Blood. Uh, and it's so called because a lot of the Florida volunteers never actually saw a lot of action over in, over in Texas and, and uh, in Mexico, even though they did make it uh, over there. So uh, we'll look at, at those different sources to see what we can use here. All right, compiled muster rolls and service records of Florida volunteers. This is also uh, something that was done by the Florida Department of Military Affairs in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there weren't, since there weren't that many folks who participated, it's all located in one volume that we can get through uh, to through UF Digital Collections. So let's uh, let's take a look at that really fast. Once again, I'm going to go back to uh, UF Digital Collections, there's their front page, and if I type in uh, Mexican War Volunteers, let's try that, that should do it. There we go, compiled muster and service records, Florida Militia Volunteers War with Mexico, right there, super easy to use. And so that's going to have not only the muster rolls, but it'll have a little bit of biographical data about each of the folks 
who uh, served in the war. So very handy to use. Robart's roster of Mexican war veterans. This is available through archive.org. Okay, so if we go here, if you haven't had a chance to use archive.org before, uh, they've got all kinds of uh, stuff that they have digitized. We are a partner with archive.org here at the State Library and Archives. They've uh, digitized a lot of stuff that we have here in the State Library of Florida. And so if we type in Mexican War Veterans, we may be able to get it without putting in Robart's name. Let's see what we get. Oh, look, there it is. All right, and you got two different versions here. I'm going to choose the black and white one because it's probably going to load faster than the full color one. But once we get into it, the great thing about this is just like uh, those, uh, those, those PDFs that we looked at earlier, you're going to be able to use this tool search inside. You're going to be able to um, um, you're going to be able to actually run a keyword search on the entire document. So let's say that I had an ancestor named Thompson, and I'm curious to know if there were any Thompsons. Wow, look at that. John Thompson, B.E. Thompson, Davis Thompson. We've got all kinds of folks. All of these little points here on the bottom, these are all individual ancestors who have the name Thompson somewhere in there. Um, so it's just a really super easy tool to use. All right. Let's jump back over to our PowerPoint. Russell James, Too Late for Blood. Again, this started out as a master's thesis, and then he turned around, and, and uh, people loved the data so much that he sort of republished the thesis as a nice user's guide uh, for folks who were looking, at, looking for ancestors who fought in the Mexican War. There are several different kinds of indexes that he includes in here, which is a list of deaths and discharges. Uh, of, of people who, uh, Florida volunteers who went over to the Mexican War and, and ended up dying. There's also a list of, of everybody who got discharged, when they were discharged, where they were discharged, muster rolls of the three or four companies that fought, uh, also an index of the pension and land bounty records. Now, we don't have, it doesn't include the text from the actual pension and land bounty documents in this book. That would have taken up a lot more space than I think Mr. James had in the book. But what he puts in there that's so fantastic is the actual numbers for those records. The federal government has actually numbered those land bounty applications and those pension applications for both the volunteers and their widows uh, who were eligible for pensions uh, because of their husband's service or, or the soldier's service. And those numbers, once you've got that pension number, that's really going to help you sort through the records that are available from other sources. So this book, it's not a terribly thick book. It is available in print from a number of different libraries. Uh, you can figure that out by going on WorldCat uh, or another, uh, another um, uh, library sort of aggregator that's going to give you the catalog records for these books. Uh, you can also contact the State Archives Reference Desk uh, if you have a specific inquiry. It doesn't take too long to go through this book, so if you called the State Archives Reference Desk and said, hey, could you look through this very specific book here, uh, look through the index of uh, pension and land bounty records and, and see if there's somebody with the last name Thompson in there, uh, then that's something that they would be able to do for you. Uh, so there we go. All right, let's move into the Civil War. Uh, this is one of the conflicts where, as you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of interest and a lot has been done to make records available for the Civil War. Uh, so there's a lot that we can look at here. We're going to start with my favorite starting point for any investigation into an ancestor who fought for a Florida unit in the Civil War, and that is the Coles-Hartman bi uh, biographical rosters. We'll also look at compiled service records, pension applications, which are also excellent, uh, and these are good for ancestors who may not have necessarily fought in a Florida unit. They could have fought in Alabama or the Carolinas or Tennessee, um, but maybe they just were living in Florida by the time they decided to draw a pension. Uh, and, of course, other states have records for the pensions that they gave out as well. And then, of course, the WPA Veteran Grave Registration Project is going to help us out with Civil War ancestors as well. All right, so starting off first, the Coles-Hartman biographical rosters. What this was, David Coles was, a, was an archivist here at the State Archives for a number of years, and he and his, uh, his uh, work partner, uh, David Hartman, created an incredible six-volume um, aggregated uh, uh, set of, of volumes where they essentially created little, little abstract service records. Uh, 
uh, for every single human being who, who fought not only in Florida's Confederate units, but also in the two cavalry units that fought uh, for the Union, uh, the first and second Florida cavalry. Uh, that's, that's something that you should keep in mind, and, and this can sometimes be a little surprising to patrons who ask about this. We've, I've had folks come to me before and say, you know, I've, I've got, you know, my ancestor has got second Florida cavalry on his tombstone that I've looked and I can't find his compiled service record for the Confederate compiled service records. And many times that's because uh, the ancestor actually served in a union, Florida unit, not in a Confederate unit. So that's, that's certainly something important to keep in mind. So here's, here's how the, the Coles-Hartman biographical rosters work. Let's say, for example, uh, that I had uh, an ancestor uh, named, um, let's see, we'll go with uh, John Beatty Lamb, Jr., okay? And uh, he's from Manatee County, all right? So I can go into the index for the uh, for the uh, uh, the Coles Hartman biographical rosters, and it's a huge six volume set. So you go into the last volume, and it's got this index here with every single individual that's represented in the set in the index. And if I go to him, it's going to tell me what unit he was in and what page number I would need to go to to go to that information. So if I go look at the second Florida uh, seventh Florida Infantry's information, and I go to page 688 in there, look at here what I get. They've, cr they've cross-referenced uh, each individual service record with all kinds of stuff. They've looked them up in the census, they've looked them up in death records, they've looked them up in, in cemetery records, all kinds of things. You can look through some of these different entries to see the kinds of stuff that they've put in here. Um, just for the one that I pulled out here, John Beatty Lamb Jr., I get his birth date, where he was born, when he died, where he's buried, what county. I get his enlistment date. Uh, you know, they've cross-referenced it with capture and prisoner of war records, hospital records, uh, just incredible things. So I can find out a lot about this individual just right there. So this is a great starting point because you're going to be able to find out uh, the, the unit that your ancestor served in. Sometimes they're going to have served in multiple units. So for example, if I go back over here to the index, see how it says John B. Lamb, John Beatty Lamb, Jr. Those could very well be the same person. If Coles and Hartman were not able to positively say that, that records that look like they belong to the same person did, they would create multiple entries uh, so that you would be able to be the judge as to whether they're actually, those records are referring to the same person. Uh, so that can be very handy because they, they haven't made a whole lot of assumptions here. Uh, they've tried very hard to, to let you do the, be the one to sort of judge those records. Um, something else that's helpful about this is, is once you get to where your ancestor is located, you're going to also get some great information about the uh, unit that they served in. So, for example, when uh, going along with John Beatty Lamb, Jr., he was uh, in the 7th Florida Infantry, so I can get some information about where his regiment served. Um, also, once you know his infantry regiment, you're going to be able to, to look up histories of that infantry regiment um, you know, you can Google them, look through Google Books, look through the library catalog at your local library and find all kinds of books about that. Uh, you can also get the staff uh, who were uh, part of that, uh, part, who were commanding that unit and just find out all sorts of great things. So that's a great jumping off point, but what else can we look at? All right, compiled service records. Just like the Indian Wars, this is essentially the same concept. These are not the records themselves. Trust me, those muster rolls were looking pretty battered by the time they came back to headquarters from the field. But what these are are index cards where they went through and created a card uh, sort of referencing every time that a soldier was mentioned on some kind of unit level record. And those card files have been sort of gathered up together and are now retained by the National Archives. And so we have those for the Civil War, just like we have uh, for um, uh, just like we had for the Indian Wars. Now, the best place to get these rather than Ancestry, Fold 3 makes it a little easier to get to Civil War service records. I prefer using Fold 3 for Civil War stuff. Um, I, I think you guys will find it easier as well. So let's go right to our internet browser. And I've already got Fold 3 pulled up right here. What I love about Fold 3, it's specifically military focused. So they've actually got all of their records kind of organized by conflict right here, which is going to help you out tremendously. All right, if I click on Civil War right here, uh, they're going to show you all the different kinds of records. Oh, it's going to make me log in again. 
Let me do that really quick. And again, Fold3, you can purchase an individual um, you can purchase an individual subscription to Fold3. Uh, oftentimes, genealogical libraries, um, public libraries, university libraries are going to have that for you already. This is the method that I would use to get to it if I was here at the State Library on site. Uh, but but that how you get to it will depend on what kind of what kind of um, uh, connection you have to Fold3 in the institution that you're using. All right, so here we go, back into Fold3. Looking at the Civil War, um, let's browse all Civil War titles. Okay, and what I want is Civil War Service Records. Okay, let's see, Civil War Service Records. And then you get to choose whether you're looking for Confederates. And by the way, by the, you again, this is helpful if you don't happen to know whether your your ancestor was in the was in a Confederate or Union record. However, what you you can get this as granular or as broad as you want. Once you get as far as you think you want to go, stop going farther along in the in this breadcrumb here and go ahead and start searching. Now, let's say that I know that I've got an ancestor who was. In, uh, who, was, who served in the Confederacy. But let's say that I'm not sure that he was in a Florida unit. Let's say that I thought he might have still been living in Georgia at that time, or maybe he served in the Carolinas or Alabama. I can go ahead and search at this level and only search for just Confederate records from any state. However, if I want to sort of weed out all of the other John Williamses from every other state, and I know that he's in Florida, I can go here. I can even drill down all the way to specific units if I want to. But once again, I, I would encourage you to, to only go down as far as you absolutely have to because you never know. Sometimes family lore can be incorrect. Uh, sometimes an ancestor might have served in multiple units and you don't want to cheat yourself out of those potentially rich search results. You know, so you can run a search at that level. Now this is going to turn back a lot of folks because uh, there's a lot of Williamses, but you can see what it'll do here. It'll take you back to each individual who is responsive to those search results. Lots and lots of stuff. Okay, so let's jump back into the PowerPoint. All right, Confederate pension applications. All right, these are great for a lot more than just, uh, than, than just studying the, uh, the pensions, but, but let's, uh, let, let me give you a little introduction to kind of what these are. So, um, because the Confederate soldiers had been in a war against the United States, the United States government did not actually provide a pension to veteran, to Confederate veterans of the Civil War. Instead, the states, the individual former Confederate states jumped in and produced their own pension program. Okay, each state had their own, and so in order to get these pension applications and the rich information that's in them, you've got to go back to the state where the ancestor actually applied for the pension because that's which state government would have retained the records. So you would want to do this, uh, the, the pension applications that we're wanting to look at, these only work for soldiers who applied for their Confederate pension in Florida. They could have fought in any state. They could have fought in, any, any conf in the Confederate Army in any state, but they had to apply for their pension in Florida for them to be in this record source that we're going to look at next. Now, uh, these are available from several different sources, uh, but being a Florida Memory guy myself, I prefer to use FloridaMemory.com to look through them. And so the, the way to get to that is to go to FloridaMemory.com. This requires no user account to use. It's completely free to use. This is a service provided uh, by the Division of Library and Information Services right here at the uh, Florida Department of State. We click on Collections and go to the Confederate Pension Applications right here. Now, uh, if you're doing a county history and you're just wanting to get to all of the, the pensions in a particular county, you can do that. You can just click on a county and not put in a name and you can get to everybody who has anything to do for, with Bradford County. Uh, or if you're looking for a particular name, let's say for example that I wanted to look for my buddy John Beatty Lamb. Uh, let me just put in Lamb. Again, you don't want to cheat yourself out of, out of good records just because the uh, record keepers put the name down a little differently than what you know the name to be. So don't cheat yourself out of records. All right, so oh look here. I've got a John B. Lamb, I've got a John Beatty Lamb, 
Okay, and who knows whether these are exactly the same people. I would need to examine the records to determine whether they're referring to the same person. It is possible for there to be multiple application files for a single individual. But once you get into the record, these can sometimes be quite thick. For example, I'm seeing that this one's 27 pages long. Okay, there's all kinds of information in these pension applications because in order for the State Pension Board to grant a pension to the veteran, or to his widow, um, they would have to prove that they had some kind of qualifying disability. They had to prove that they had actually fought during the Civil War. And in fact, the State Pension Board would confirm that with the War Department. Uh, so it's, it's, there's really an interesting set of correspondence that goes through here. Sometimes the pension applications will include affidavits from people who fought with the veterans. Um, the county commissioners had to sign off on it. See here we've got an affidavit signed by a couple of different citizens saying, yes, we know this guy, he's not faking it, he did actually fight in the war. Sometimes if there were some questions about whether or not the person actually fought uh, in the conflict, if the state pension board was not able to find the records that they wanted to prove it, they would actually send letters back and forth. Sometimes attorneys would get involved um, and, you know, for the widow's pension, they would have to prove that they were actually married. The widow would have to actually prove that they had been married uh, to the individual. So sometimes you get marriage dates in here, or even copies of the, of the wedding certificate, the marriage certificate. Uh, so there's just all kinds of good information in here about the, the veteran service. See, we've gotten in here, we've gotten, uh, we're looking at relatives who are interested in, in knowing more about an, an ancestor's service. So there's just all kinds of great stuff in here to use. All right, let's jump back into the PowerPoint. And again, what we have here, these are the applications just for veterans who applied for their Confederate pension in Florida. Other states have these. Many of them are online. Most of them, I would say, are now online. Hmm. The Mormon Church has actually digitized a lot of them and made them available uh, through a couple of different outlets. So that's that's one place. And Family Search, I believe, has them as well. FamilySearch.org. Uh, the WPA Veteran Grave Registration Project, we've already looked at how to uh, get to those records uh, from, um, uh, to, uh, how to get to those records. We've already looked at that with the Indian Wars. Uh, just, just one quick thing to point out, uh, because there were Confederate and Union soldiers uh, who both, both of those uh, for, who fought uh, for Florida units, when you go through and look at the, uh, the war column in those veteran grave registration lists, C stands for Confederate, U stands for Union. Okay, and these of course are going to be World War I veterans. That's what W means. Again, a guide to those abbreviations is going to be included at the beginning of each volume in the WPA Grave Registration Project volumes. Okay, I want to take a quick break from talking about specific conflicts to talk a little bit about the militia. Okay, even when there was not a war on or imminent, the state still maintained a, a state militia. And nowadays we know that as the Florida National Guard, which is established, um, I mean, the, the, the National Guard kind of gets established in stages in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's finally definitely known as the Florida National Guard uh, in the 20th century. But even before that, there was a state militia, and, and it used to, to sort of be very organic. Rather than the state kind of running the show um, and, and actually being in charge of recruitment and all that sort of thing, used to individual counties and individual communities would actually get a group of guys together and elect their own officers, and they would appeal to the state and say, hey, we've got this muster roll, and we've got all these guys who have signed up to be members of a militia unit. Please recognize us and give us whatever we're due in terms of, you know, a uniform allowance or weapons or whatever the law, um, whatever the law provided for at that time, and that does change over time. So it's very organic. Um, the muster rolls are not terribly complex that you can get your hands on. I've got an example of one right here on the right side of your screen. Usually you just get uh, a name, um, you know, what, what date that they signed on to be a member of the unit. Sometimes they're even, so this one happens to be on a nice pre-printed uh, sheet. Sometimes it's just on a scrap of paper. 
you know, something somebody tore out of their ledger or something like that. But what's great about these is as genealogists, we know that anytime you can put a specific person in a specific place at a specific time, that is a valuable data point. And so we have actually undertaken to digitize all of these muster rolls. Since these guys are not necessarily signing up to fight in any particular war, there has not been a lot of emphasis on getting these digitized. Uh, to our knowledge, most of these muster rolls from the 19th century, with the exception of the ones that went into militia units that were activated to serve in the Civil War, the Indian Wars, or the Spanish-American War, there are a lot of muster rolls that have never been digitized by anybody and are not available anywhere else online. And so we are just about to have those up on floridamemory.com. I expect that we'll have them up by the end of this fiscal year, uh, so sometime before June. But you can, even, even without getting to them, if, if there's a unit that you'd like to, to get a, a copy of the muster roll for, you can already do that. Uh, so let me show you how you access those. What you would need to do is look through the Archives Online catalog and look at the series, the record series, where those are kept, and then look and see which ones we, at which units uh, we have a muster roll for, and you can get a copy of them by contacting the State Archives Reference Desk. So let me show you how you would do that. First thing you need to do is go to the Archives Online Catalog, which is uh, accessible from archivescatalog.info.florida.gov. All right, that's going to bring you to this page, and I'm going to show you a quick shortcut to get exactly to these records. Now, you might have noticed on the PowerPoint slide that I said that, uh, that most of these come from Series S1146. All of our series and collections are numbered that way, and I'm going to show you a shortcut to get to exactly those things. All right, if I want to go straight to the catalog record for those particular, uh, for those particular muster rolls, I can type in S space 1146 and put it in quotes. I'm searching at the series collection level. All right. Let's see if it's going to let us do it. The server was having some trouble this morning. Oh, good. There we go. All right, and it's going to give me back exactly what I asked for. If I click on this little number over here on the left-hand side, this is going to give you a little bit more information about exactly what the series contains, uh, exactly the extent of the, the series. But if I want to look at exactly what roles are available, they haven't all been digitized, but they, I can at least look at a list of them. I'm going to click on this folder icon here. And this is going to take me to a list of them. Look here. We've got all these from Alachua County, Bradford, Citrus, Clay. You just keep looking until you find your county, and then you can see exactly what we have on there. Again, this is in the Archives online catalog. Okay. Moving on to the Spanish-American War. We've got two kinds of records for this. Mobilization list from the Florida State Troops and Naval Militia. That's right, we had a Naval Militia. It was created three different times. The first time was in the 1890s when it was beginning to look like the United States was going to get involved in the Spanish-American War, which started out completely as an independence uh, ploy by the Cubans to throw off the, uh, the uh, Spanish rule. Uh, it broke out. This is not the first time that they had attempted to become independent, but 1898 is when it really got hot and the United States got involved uh, after the Maine exploded in Havana Harbor. Okay, so we've got mobilization lists for the Florida State Troops. We've also got compiled service records for those individuals who were eventually absorbed into federal service from state troops and other sources. Okay, those mobilization lists are available from UF Digital Collections. We've already looked at how to get to UF Digital Collections, so I'm not going to go to it right here, but essentially you'd look for it the same way. You would search for mobilization lists and maybe throw in the word Spanish as well, just so that it takes you specifically to the list for that conflict. Um, compiled service records. Again, we've looked at Fold 3. You've seen kind of what these look like. But that's, uh, that's, those are available for Spanish-American War, just the same as they are the Civil War and, um, and the Indian Wars that we looked at. Again, those are on fold3.com. And the WPA Grave Registration Projects. If you look at some of the pages, uh, you'll see SA, the abbreviation SA in the war column, and that is referring to veterans who fought in the Spanish-American War. Now, if you look here, you see that this guy, he says USA. This one says Company F of the 1st Florida Infantry. That is referring to the 1st Florida Infantry as in a state unit. 
Okay, uh, that was that was eventually absorbed, most likely, into a, into a U.S. unit. This guy, that means that they were only able to determine that he fought in a regular U.S. Army unit of some sort. All right, moving on to World War I. We've got uh, draft registration cards, World War I service cards, which are available from Florida Memory, county guard commissions. This is something kind of unique uh, that I want to make sure that we talk about. Uh, and then, of course, the veteran grave registration stuff as well. So draft registration cards, these are great because it not only includes people who actually were drafted and who actually fought in the war, but there were also a number of folks who signed up for the draft but they never actually participated in the war for one reason or another. Maybe they were just never called. Maybe they had a deferment of some sort because they were a new dad or, or they had a, a vital war-related business or something like that. Draft registration cards are great because if you can't find somebody uh, who you know lived through that time period, if you can't find their military records in the compiled service records, you can oftentimes find where they registered for a draft. It's a bigger pot of people. So these are available from Fold 3. We've looked at Fold 3. You saw how on the left-hand side there you can just sort of uh, sort the records by what conflict they refer to. Super easy to get to these. All right, World War I service cards. Uh, these are available on FloridaMemory.com, so you don't even have to have a subscription to Ancestry or to um, uh, or, or to Fold 3 to use these. You just go right to Florida Memory and go to that collections page, and uh, they're right there to look at. But there is a third kind of uh, record that, that I, some of you may, may not have imagined this. So when World War I broke out, uh, when it became clear that the United States military was going to get involved in World War I, the entire Florida National Guard got called up for federal service. Okay, so a lot of Floridians were thinking, well, who's going to protect the home front? Who's going to protect us here in the state? Um, the state had the right to call up another, you know, to, to create some other form of militia. You know, that's the whole right to right for there to be a, a militia type thing. And so that's exactly what the state government did. The state government actually established a second militia because the Florida National Guard had been activated for federal service, so they wanted to have some kind of military organization available in the unlikely event of an invasion or some other uh, emergency here on the home front. And so they created what they called the county guards. And uh, there are actually records uh, of the county guards. We've got a lot of great pictures of them on Florida Memory. You can find a lot of great, um, uh, a lot of newspaper accounts of what these county guard units were doing. They were had lots of parades and did a lot with the bond drives and things like that. But they also were around just in case they were needed uh, to, to uh, combat public disturbances or, or fend off a potential attack. And we have the, uh, the commissions for the commissioned officers who served in the county guards. Uh, so we can, we can look those up by name on FloridaMemory.com. I'll just show you real quick. Uh, where you go to for that. If we go to Florida Memory, so here's the front page of Florida Memory, and we go to Collections, here's those World War I service cards right here. You can search those and you can even drill down by which, uh, you, can, you can drill down to whichever um, uh, service branch that an ancestor was in. You can also sort by race, all right? But these County Guard Commissions, you can click on those as well. Uh, there's not a whole there's not a whole lot of information on these commissions. They're designed the same way that commissions for county and state officers are done. So there's not really a whole lot on there. But again, anytime you can get a specific person nailed down to a specific place at a specific time, it's a good data point. Also, if you've got an ancestor and family lore says that this ancestor fought in World War I, but you haven't been able to find a compiled service record or a service card, oftentimes it's because they did serve. It's just they served in this military unit that was on the home front who just doesn't really show up in any other records because it was strictly a state unit. Okay, so once you, um, you know, once you get to that, you can figure out exactly where they lived and what their rank was. All right, go in here. Uh, again, the WPA Veteran Grave Registration Project, we've uh, got those. The W's are going to be the World War veterans. Remember that only one World War had happened by the time that these records were created in the 30s, so there are no World War II uh, veterans listed in here. It's only going to be World War I. 
All right. Finally, our last, uh, our last conflict here that we'll talk about today, World War II. Uh, we've got draft registration cards, enlistment records, uh, the State Guard roster, which is essentially the same thing as the County Guards from World War I. It's just they decided to call it the State Guards in World War II. And then we've got the Fatal Casualties list as well that we'll look at. So these are what it, this is what a draft registration card looks like uh, for World War II. You can get these from fold3.com. We've already looked at that database, so you've got an idea of how to get to that. Again, you can drill right down to World War II documents on Fold3 and just type in draft registration cards, or it'll be available in the menu right there. Lots of great biographical data. You get to figure out something about their next of kin, where they lived. Um, if they were predisposed for a particular service branch, you'll see that in there. Uh, what kind of job that they were doing. This can be really great stuff. Um, so there's that. Enlistment records, Ancestry has these available if you go into that card catalog uh, that we looked at earlier where you go to Ancestry.com, click on the search, uh, the search menu and look at card catalog. You can type in World War II Army enlistment records. They have these for the Navy as well. And they don't have the actual images of the records, uh, but they do have indexes. Uh, so this is, for example, this is the index listing for a guy named James F. Murphy, who enlisted, uh, he was from DeSoto County, and he enlisted at Camp Blanding. So another handy bit to look at. Uh, the Florida State Guard roster, again, the Florida National Guard was activated in 1940. So once, once they started going into regular federal units, uh, there was kind of nobody left to protect the home front. So the state established a Florida State Guard to take their place. And this is mostly going to be folks who were too old for the draft or, or um, you know, folks who had some kind of deferment or something to where they, they had an essential war job, but they were at least signed up for duty. So the state had an inventory of which people they had around uh, to potentially serve in the event of an attack on the home front. These are available, the, the, the roster is available in three volumes from UF Digital Collections. Just type in Florida State Guard and uh, in, in quotation marks, it's, that's going to get you right to it. Um, there we go. All right, and last but not least, the fatal casualties list for World Wars One and Two. This is also available from UF Digital Collections, um, and it's going to give you a little bit of information about the parents of the deceased. It'll also give you their last address. Um, and this is also something that the Florida Department of Military Affairs put together in the, four, in the uh, 70s and 80s. This is actually a reprint of a federal document, uh, but uh, they've, they've made it digitally available through UF Digital Collections. That was a marathon, but that is, that is, again, there are other kinds of records as well, but hopefully this will at least give you uh, a, a, some starting points for researching uh, a military, uh, the military career of an ancestor um, and, and if you run across cases where you've gone through the stuff that we've looked at, but you're hungry to know more and you're interested to know what other kinds of records are available, I'm certainly glad to, uh, to, to, to help you advise on this. Our reference desk uh, is certainly available to help with this as well. They've always got some good ideas. Um, there's, there's far more out there than what we could talk about today. I just wanted to make sure to give you some of the really low-hanging fruit um, for this purpose. So. That is, that is it, and we're ready to, to take some questions. All right, this is Melissa. Does anybody have any questions? You can either type them into chat. Um, I, Maria, yes, we will have this PowerPoint available. We'll be sending out this, um, <laughs> we'll be sending out this information, um, including the recording and the PowerPoints and anything else that, that Josh deems to be helpful to you. Um, so stay tuned for that. That should be coming in the next couple of days. Yes, and I apologize for uh, for speaking at 90 miles an hour, but as you can see from the amount that was that was in here, we would have never had time to get through it had I not been a complete motor mouth. The good news is is that we will be posting this to YouTube, so you'll be able to go back and look at the section that pertains uh, to whatever you're interested in and replay it a few times <laughs> if you like. Great. Does anybody have any other questions? We'll stay on for a few minutes and make sure that we get any questions you guys have addressed. And like I said, you can either type it into chat or, as you've probably noticed, all of your microphones have been muted to eliminate any background noise. We can unmute you um, 
and you can ask your questions out loud. Just click the little hand raise button in the right hand side there and we'll know that you want to say something out loud. We've got a question. Um, where would you find info on soldiers who fought in the Western Indian Wars? Okay, so those are going to be, there's a couple of different ways that you could get to that. And, and depending on which Western Indian War you're referring to, I mean, if you're thinking about ancestors who may have fought, uh, you know, during the period of Western expansion, um, you, could, uh, you could look at the registers of, of enlistment for the Army, which is available from Fold 3. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at that? That's going to help us out. Let's just jump over to Fold 3 and see if we can get back to the main page. Fold 3 is going to have a lot of these. Uh, if you look at this section on Mexican-American and early Indian Wars, this is going to have a few. This is mostly dealing with the eastern United States, but depending on how west you want to talk about, the Creek Wars are included uh, in, these, in these records as well. Um, let's see. Let's see what kinds of stuff they have in this list as well. All right. Ooh, okay, here we go. This Army Register of Enlistment, if, if your ancestor enlisted in a regular army unit, there's going to be at least an index listing in here most likely. Again, this is one of those cases where you do want to be very careful uh, because you don't know exactly whether they enlisted using their initials or maybe first name and middle initial instead of the whole name that you know. Uh, just be prepared for those to be a little different. Also, be prepared for there to be several iterations of the same name because you know the, these registers are talking about the entire army for a lengthy period of time. Um, if you had an ancestor who was eligible for a land bounty because of their military service, these land uh, land bounty applications uh, are going to help. We here in Florida, of course, the uh, the Armed Occupation Act of 1842, uh, you're going to be able to get to those land bounty applications. That's a big thing for those of us here in Florida, uh, but that's specifically for, uh, for soldiers who fought in the Second Seminole War. Does anybody have any more questions? And again, I'm certainly uh, certainly happy to to take questions by email or or you know give me a phone call or something. Uh, any anything that happens to come up, I know every every genealogical inquiry is is different, uh, and uh, we we certainly want to to do whatever we can to get you out of the particular jam you happen to be in. Uh, if you hit a dead end with an ancestor, we're happy to at least bounce some ideas off and, and give you an idea of where to go next. Um, so please feel free. We're going to give you guys a couple more minutes in case there's any more questions that come up. But um, oh good, thanks for being on, Catherine. Um, you can always contact um, Josh if you've got questions, and um, I'm sure he would be happy to help you out individually also. Thank you guys for all being on today. Um, stay tuned for our next one. And Josh, thank you for all of your wonderful information. Glad to help.